fontein, bij magers fontein, bij magers fontein, draak ons die lijn. Good evening, I'm Greg Gibbons. I'm joined by Chris Reservoir. We're from papercartridges.com. And Calvin. And and Calvin the Creeks one. But today is December eleventh, two thousand nineteen. And so as as you know, today is of course the one hundred and twentieth anniversary of the Battle of Machersfontein in the Second Anglo Boer War. So we're gonna talk today. Um, not so much about the history of the battle because you can find how the battle went and the commanders and everything that happened in that battle elsewhere. Uh, this is more of an analysis of why this battle was important. What made a small forgotten battle in uh, frankly a small and completely forgotten war today. What made this so important in military history and we're going to discuss the shift in battlefield tactics and the use of the weapons that we saw at the very end of the 19th century, again, 1899, so at the cusp of, of the 20th century. And what's fascinating about this battle to me is that uh, the, the Boers, the Boer fighters, were primarily civilians. These were farmers and ranchers and they worked in the gold and diamond mines um, these were not professional soldiers their day job they're not professionals they're not even right. reservists no they're just they're homesteaders and the their government buys a modern seven millimeter smokeless powder rifle gives it to them and they go out and on the, at, at Marcus Fontaine and several other battles during this week in 1899 it's called the Black Week of the British Army, these people defeat the regular British Army with some of the proudest regiments in the British Army, the Black Watch, the uh, Seaforth Highlanders, Highlanders uh, uh, bring them to a halt and the Boers are holding the battlefield at the end of these actions. So that should tell us uh, today it, you know, people in now in the 21st century, especially those interested in in um, paradigm shifts in military history, this should tell us this is a battle. What happened here needs to be studied because the standing army, with all the doctrinal tactics and weapons that officers that had gone to academy and been trained, Sandhurst officers. Uh, this is how you fight a war, and they're not just defeated, but soundly defeated in and, many cases. And humiliating, uh, humiliating yeah. defeats. And very, and the victories they did have in some of these campaigns were extraordinarily expensive uh, in terms of manpower. Oh yeah, and it, it, the Second Anglo-Boer War uh, was far more expensive to the British Empire than all of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, they ended up having to send 300,000 men to South Africa to basically subdue and occupy 30,000 uh, Boer fighters. Um, and what's interesting about this battle to me is that these, these Boer soldiers, if you could even call them that, um, invented or, or at least introduced us to what we would now think today as um, modern 20th century tactics uh, because the the unique cultural aspects that they brought to war so yeah, the irony of it all being that you know this huge paradigm shift in, in military tactics and doctrine is brought about by unprofessionals um, you know total yeah. utter laymen Just, in, in military terms who armed themselves well and uh, Essentially refused to fight by the uh, by the playbook, um, and, and, and you see the playbook to go off. Of. And you see you see in some of the engagements they're not what we would call today asymmetrical. Um, they're not asymmetrical warfare. There are, you know, organized engagements, um, but it's it there are echoes of it today, where you see the, the a lot of the fighting that's been going on in Afghanistan with 
the Russians in the 80s and us the last decade and some change where yes we have a lot of technology we have a lot of training we're a very powerful and professional army and we are still unable to sort of gain any decisive um, decisive victory oh, against yeah, an, an, absolutely. an untrained um, asymmetrical enemy the, the echoes of the Boer War you know, the, the very end of the 19th century still reverberate very loudly in the, in the world we live in today um, and, and it is not on uh, YouTube there are just such a small handful of, of anyone that has put out any content on uh, on Mockers Fontaine in particular and the Second Boer War in general. There's, yeah, there's very it's, little of it. It's eclipsed. There's so many other things that happened so quickly that were so much larger. Uh, the British casualties on Mockers Fontaine, you know, about 950. That includes killed, wounded, and captured. That's That's a good... 10 or 15 minutes in some battles yeah, on the Western Front. Yeah, that's uh, breakfast 15 on the years song. later. You know, it's... it's so but it, the, the important thing to remember with looking looking at these engagements is it's it's not necessarily the numbers that matter. It's the percentage, mm. um, percentage of troops present and the actual tactical gain or loss um, based on these on these fights. Is Yes, Magris Fontaine, sure, it's less than a thousand casualties. But the ripple effect of what that did to the British Army yeah. you know it, it broke the tip off of the spear um, you know a spear at the time crafted of very 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 well known you know household name regiments yeah. that were lauded as the elite um, with combat experience with recent combat experience in and the they positively had their teeth kicked in um, I like studying and I use this phrase a lot. I use it a lot in <clears throat> my book, The Destroying Angel, which is on Amazon for $12. I use that phrase a lot, probably overuse it, but I like looking at when did something change dramatically. So the paradigm, the old paradigm that we're operating under is now either uh, completely changed or modified to some You're extent. throwing out the playbook. And more interestingly, I enjoy studying how people reacted to those changes. 90% of the time, they get it, what we would now today say, wrong. And we look back and we say, well, why did the British advance into fire from modern smokeless powder, high velocity rifles in columns? And we, we cast uh, what we know today back on them. but. Uh, you have to look at why they made these decisions yeah. because we are today, and by we, I mean not just the United States military, but, but uh, military science in general, technology has changed rapidly in, uh, in the second half of the 19th century, so much so that we honestly don't have any idea what a major war is going to look like. And you, you can't predict what it's going to look like but what you can learn is how did they deal with it back then uh, when paradigms shifted in the past how they reacted to it and how to mitigate the difficulties that come from that transition which I would argue started um, in, in this era mid 19th century I would argue it started in the 1850s when the rifle was first adopted by the militaries of Europe and the United States, so that now uh, you, you, the individual soldier has a weapon capable of decisively defeating an enemy with projectile firepower only. So uh, the bayonet and actual hand-to-hand -hand get up close in person with the enemy and fight him you know, soldier to soldier, that the old Napoleonic and pre-Napoleonic yeah. paradigm fire fades volley away. and charge. And yeah. if you look, uh, just, just for, I mean, for for American context, if you look at the American Civil War, um, even though the American military didn't hardly scratch the surface on the potential of of rifled muskets as an implement, there was still enough of a change 
in firepower that the the number of bayonet wounds you see in casualty reports across the war versus any Napoleonic conflict or a conflict fought primarily with soldiers armed with smoothbores, the number of bayonet casualties is yeah, infinitesimal. There, it, it, yeah. and, and what's interesting there is that was in spite of both armies using French-inspired tactics that the goal is to close with mm-hmm. and uh, attack the enemy, get to the bayonet, and win with the, the bayonet was decisive. Hardy's tactics is French 1830s, 1840s chasseur tactics. So even though they were trying to get close and fight with the bayonet, they still couldn't. Didn't uh, a bunch of reasons for that too? The the lack of a professionally trained armies. Um, but uh, the takeaway is that projectile combat is now by the American Civil War. And then by the Franco-Prussian War in 1866, and then um, uh, or the Austro-Prussian War in 1866, Franco-Prussian War in 1870, you fight your enemy with projectiles, and the main mode of combat on the battlefield is a infantryman with a rifle, um, and these rifles had considerable limitations. They're black powder, so the bullet moves very slowly uh, by you know, modern standards, a thousand feet per second, give or take. A very um, sh- a, a rainbow-like trajectory so that it's, it works, but it has considerable limitations. It has considerable limitations, and to, to really be effective with it takes a lot of training. Range yeah. estimation becomes far more important. Um, you know, your, your, your basic shooting fundamentals um, become massively more important with a rifle that small because of the, the the way the danger space fluctuates compared to something flat shooting like in this case seven by fifty seven Mauser, which even now is revered as an extremely it's flat, still a flat shooting high car. velocity. It, it is respectable today, but e- even in the mid nineteenth century, the f- fire, the firepower of, of infantry rifles had become decisive that is the decisive factor on the battlefield in spite of the limitations Um, the the trajectory the weight of the ammunition soldiers don't have very much ammunition and so that forces commanders to have very strict fire control so command and control is uh, as important in the mid 19th century as it was in the Napoleonic era and commanders are afraid to deploy their forces into a firing line too soon because then they lose that immediate command and control ability yeah. and soldiers will fire off their ammunition. Yes, especially so like when you're using the, 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 N, the P-53 Enfield infantryman's rig, maxed out you're carrying 60 rounds. Now... The other thing that these generals are trying to manage among command and control and among mm-hmm. ammunition expenditure is if your soldiers shoot off 60 rounds, you have the problem of resupplying it. And then are there, we- you know, do they have to be pulled off the line so they can clean yeah. these weapons to continue firing them? Um, you know, it's, it's, it becomes a very complicated question when you really, when you really extrapolate and, and look into well, for um, sure, there's there's reasons why. There's they, reasons that are not that are not they did. immediately right. apparent. We we look at them now and we think, oh, how obsolete, how pigheaded, didn't they know any better? And the the real answer is, well, they. It was a reasonable answer to the yeah, problem. There wasn't there wasn't an apparently better way to do it. There's no there's no walkie talkies. There's yeah. no, you can't hop on a Singar. Well, when it gets even worse, black powder rifles, the ranges are still fairly close. And we're also dealing with the logistical revolution in the late 19th, yes. mid to late 19th century where railroads are so much more faster. Um, and the size of armies, the size of the army you can take to the battlefield is getting much larger. Um, and the battlefields are getting bigger because artillery ranges are increasing. Yeah. And then in 1886, is uh, another you could say uh, watershed date in very in much military so. tactics when France adopts the world's first 
smokeless powder. Eight by fifty. Well, well, we could say no. that the first, the first modern small bore infantry rifle, um, which we smokeless. don't have on the wall not, yet. Not yet. I mean, that is definitely if we can find it's one on with the a decent list. bore. Because um, yeah, I, I would like uh, <laughs> the big paradigm shifting weapons in history. But now it's it's even faster. It's got a much flatter trajectory just because the the muzzle velocity is is so much higher. That and the other the other big proponent behind smokeless powder is concealment. You know, if you have regardless of what formation your troops are in, if you're in a trench, you know, no matter how well concealed your trench is, if you open fire with smoke or smokeless powder ammunition, you maintain a certain degree of invisibility. Vice, you know, a, a line of soldiers in a trench opening up with Martini Henrys. It, it gives you that it, option, but most look at the uniform of the French army in eighteen eighty-six. This is true. They um, were not planning on getting down. Concealment in the dirt was and certainly concealing. not um, not doctrinally because they, they have a new yeah. weapon. Everyone knows. One of my my favorite figures in the British army in the mid nineteenth century was the chief instructor at the School of Musketry at Hythe. You know, we know him well, Colonel Wilford. Yes. And his almost dying breath is urging the gun makers in England to develop rifles with a higher muzzle velocity with a flatter trajectory. Yes. Because that will make a trained soldier that much more an Dangerous. adversary to an enemy. Because their fire will be effective. At closer ranges, it'll be even more effective. And at longer ranges, that danger space gets longer and longer. So everyone knows in the mid to late 19th century that it's coming. They know this flat trajectory is a good thing. We like it. We want it. Then it arrives, 1886, and other countries very quickly follow suit. Germany in 1888 with the, the 1888 Gewehr, the commission rifle. Um, the British stall a little bit longer. The, the half measure Lee Metford and then the, the Mark I Lee and Very typical of the, the British. United States with the Krag, 30-40. So yes. everyone, the Russians, 1891, the, the, our favorite, Mosin Nagant, everyone is adopting these rifles because they know this gives you so much more. But yeah. what, do you, what do you do with this technology once you have it? So they basically just take the old Napoleonic tactics that had evolved into the... the mid 19th century tactics uh, and they extrapolate them out to longer ranges so we, it, I don't yeah. have one here but there were rifles from this era usually had a volley sight that's true which was a and device you see those present up until 1916 early, yeah, up until for the, the British um, Lee Enfield but the sights on these rifles went out to 4,000 or more Meters well, to fire. How far? Just for a point of conversation, how far do the well, sights on your this, seven mil? I want to say this goes to two thousand, uh, two thousand meters. Yeah, two, <laughs> two, two kilometers. Yeah, two kilometers is the sights on uh, on this uh, model eighteen ninety five Mauser. So this is what the Boers uh, would have been carrying at at Marcus Fontaine. At least a, a large number of them. So that. They know, okay, we have this capability to shoot out to long range. But the command and control remains, for the most part, the same, um, with, with some modifications. You're still deploying on the battlefield in formations. And so these are soldiers, shoulder to shoulder, more or less, marching out and deploying into battle, because that was how commanders were able to control them. Once everyone disperses and they they hunker down, they take positions, a commander, like senior commanders, the generals, the uh, brigade and division commanders, you are losing your ability yep. to maneuver at, and control at your At that point, soldiers. you're relying on chains of runners, you're relying on, in some yeah. cases, communication by music. What made the Prussian army and then later the German army so incredibly effective in this era Small unit tactics. was that they, they had... Uh, taken the genius of the chief of staff Helmut von Molta the elder not his nephew who lost World War One, but uh, the concept of mission tactics and by the 1890s the the word Auftragstaktik was actually starting to appear in German military manuals empowering junior leaders to operate towards a mission goal given to them by their superiors 
not standing there waiting for the colonel to give them an order. Yes. But the British army in this era had not developed. Had not, uh, and there's, you know, there's there's reasons for it, but the emphasis is on uh, command and control, your formations, your fire control, the the rates of fire. Your fire is very controlled. Volleys. Everything's out to longer ranges. It's now been projected out to these great the distance, new smokeless powder ranges. The distance changed, but the tactics and administration yeah. didn't it's, change. It's very still much. it's nineteenth century tactics, with longer ranged uh, modern weapons with with full power cartridges. You know, seven millimeter Mauder three hundred three British. We consider those you know full power rifle cartridges um, to this day. And the British had success with it because for a period of, you know, after the Crimean War until the Boer War so look, from sixty From the mid-1860s in Abyssinia up through the Boer Wars, 35-odd mm-hmm. years. Yeah. It's very small, sharp, yeah. nasty colonial wars. The Zulu War, Abyssinia. They're having, um, they're having success... Because of who incredible success. Because of, in some cases, the enemy that they're fighting, um, and in a lot of cases, what the enemy is armed with. And yeah, well, the Boer and, War was certainly not well, no. what they were expecting. They had a thirty-five-year sort of wins winning streak. Uh, so and why would you? You know, why would you change and, and tactics? These tactics worked extremely well. In these campaigns, you look in 1898, the British campaign in the in the Sudan uh, against the the Mahdi, and the the casualty figures are ten thousand of the enemy and uh, a handful, a few dozen British, um, and these tactics worked very well with many of the same officers that yes. we would see. A in lot the of these regiments, Kitchener. Uh, Methuen very successfully saw these tactics that we use succeeding in these colonial wars. And when I look at this, the British Army, 20 years, fighting technologically inferior enemies for a long period of time, and have adopted their tactics, techniques for fighting these technologically inferior enemies is there a parallel today of a country, a modern major power that has a spent the last 20 major years... A professional army fighting brush fire wars against right. superior, under-equipped, and under-armed enemy? So I, these, I don't know. these parallels, history doesn't repeat itself, but it, it there are these parallels. So the by echoes, learning... The echoes are deafening yes, in some cases. Learning from this, how the British army how they did and how they reacted when they did fight an enemy that was using the same weapons they had back at them today and in, in the United States military it's, uh, you know credit where it is due there is a drum beat now we have to move away from fighting these um, counterinsurgency type yes, ocu- the, the occupation wars that quote unquote fob centric fob centric warfare uh, the Afghanistan and Iraq models where where we operate from secure areas against an enemy with very few capabilities now we have to focus on fighting a near peer because i don't think an intelligent people in uh in positions of authority have learned from history now the british army when they went in in uh, 1899 um, unfortunately assumed the tactics that had worked so well for us against uh, at Omdurman and, in... and I think I think culture has a lot to do with it. The, the you know the, we're talking about the British Empire, you know, near the top of its game. Yeah, and they're, these are these these are Dutch speaking farmers. You know, they're <laughs> they're itinerant farmers. They're poor, dirty, grubby, bearded people. Calvinists. You know, they're they're not. If if you're an imperial British colonel. A Dutch boar in a floppy hat is not yeah. the enemy that keeps you awake at night. And the the heroes, you know, Gordon of Khartoum, Kitchener, this is the the proudest moments of military honor for the the British Empire. With uh, the sun is not setting on it, they have overwhelmingly, without 
uh, a two power standard in their navy. So they have twice as many battleships as the next possible country, um, country's navy after them. And these are 30 or 40,000 ragtag, floppy hatted, bearded Calvinists with a president, the president of the Transvaal, Paul Kruger, probably apocryphally, but at one time is supposed to have met a person who had circumnavigated the globe. And he says, you're, you're full of it. The earth is flat. If the earth was a globe, the Bible would have said so. He says, I've only read one book in my life, and it is the Bible. <laughs> These are the people that have the, the incredible gall to declare war on the British Empire. These two small South African um, Boer republics in October of 1899. So they declare war on the British Empire. A lot of reasons for that. We don't have the time. Yeah, or we're not going to go into the politics behind um, it. The Jameson Raids, Cecil Rhodes, uh, the... the Cape Town to Cairo Railway, all of these these schemes, just total complete Cliff Notes version. Gold was discovered there, and uh, British British financiers, industrialists uh, wanted it. Surprise, long, surprise! Long story short, if you could boil down the, it was much more complicated than that. But to boil it down, the reason for the war, the 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 British Empire's expanding. Progress, if you could use that word, was was looming over these Boer republics, and they said, "We've had enough of it," um, and declared war. So the the British army had little reason to think that these enemies were going to be much different than the ones they had fought before. Very theoretically non-threatening. Uh, and the the Boers are uh, and Boer is farmer in in Afrikaans or Dutch. Um, and it's very similar in German. Uh, they left the Netherlands um, as uh, um, farmers, and they moved to South Africa. The, the four trekkers fought a bunch of battles, uh, learned a lot of... They, they learned how to fight in this new way Bush from the, uh, the native African enemies they were fighting, and they adopted a lot of their techniques... In Europe, you had an almost inexhaustible population. You could keep calling up Napoleonic conscripts. But in South Africa, crazy men are scarce. So they learned there's no honor. A European battle, there's honor in going down to the last man. You know, hold not one step back. We hold the line. The Boer approach is, no, you you fight until you no longer have the advantage then you fall back regroup and fight again when you have Disappear. the advantage and you so, see that we see that happening a lot in in the in the campaigns where the, oh, the boers will fight a sharp violent action and then disappear and the british military was absolutely furious yeah. you know how dare they it's almost like how dare they have the nerve to run away and so in, in press releases at the time, you see oh, the yeah. British declaring victory. We won. The enemy abandoned the field. They, they, exactly. It's that the European field. mindset. We right. held the battlefield. We won. Therefore, we won. They lost 60 men. We lost 400. And, we won. Know, sweep, sort of sweep the numbers under the rug. But they weren't there when the smoke, when the smoke cleared. Therefore, we are the victors. And, and the Boers are looking at it from a very pragmatic viewpoint of, right. well, you didn't kill us. And our entire, you know, our entire mission is to just kill you and slow you down. They're they're a incredibly unique people. Um, with with some uh, with some controversy, although you you can't project twenty first century um, political correctness on the nineteenth century, and uh, and then have any context left to discuss. Yeah. But a, a un, unique and controversial people, fiercely independent and incredibly democratic. They elected their officers, and these these were civilians formed up in units called commandos, which we still use the that word. We, use we can see uh, the influence of the Boer War still. It's uh, interesting to me that the British Army actually has units that are officially named commandos. 
Yeah, and that was borrowed from the stolen from from the Boers. Well, every almost every um, you know football fan in the UK knows about Spiegelkopf, another battle of the Anglo-Boer War, because there's Spiegelkops in many of these football stadiums. Soccer for my you know lowbrow American audience here. And they don't know that Spiegelkopf is another major battle of the Second World <laughs> War. And now there are these cops in different uh, football stadiums in the UK. Anyway, that irrelevant sidebar. But these democratic, fiercely independent Boers looked at a Mauser rifle differently than the way a European would have looked at a Mauser rifle. The Europeans had simply updated existing tactics from a previous era, a previous paradigm of warfare. It's the almost Boers, as though the European military simply looked at the rear sight and went, okay, that's all we're changing. They, they looked at this and they saw the, the capabilities that it gave them more so than um, the, the rank and file European tactics. So there was no standing army for these Boer Republics. They had a state artillery. That's the only uniform force in the, the Boer uh, Republics. And most of those uh, guarded forts that were built around Pretoria, the capital of the Transvaal. So these are all just ordinary civilians. And they're expected to provide their own horse, bring several days of food, and the government provided them a rifle and uh, more ammunition than they could ever shoot. After the Jameson Raid, which was a, um, a British scheme to cause an uprising in the, the Boer Republics, they bought tens of thousands of Mauser rifles, and most of them were made by private companies making them on license, and they wanted more export markets, so they made sure the rifles we made for the Boers are of incredible quality, because we want them... We want our reputation to spread. We want the reviews spread. to be glowing. Um, the, I want to say the 7mm round used was 2400 feet per second. It's slower than the modern Spitzer bullet because they, they were still using the old heavier round nose. But 2400 feet per second coming so soon after black powder that's twice the velocity of a, a black powder rifle so that's it's twice the velocity that much more of a very fast black space. powder rifle so for for the the boers with very few fighting men able bodied fighting men you know no more than 40 or 50,000 for the entire war in a vast area they looked at a, a Mauser rifle much differently than the the Europeans. And it took people like that to see what these weapons can do and what they're capable of. Um, I don't know how long we've been going. We've been going a long time. We haven't even gotten to the battle. Um, Trust in God it, and the Mauser. Yeah, that was uh, a, a, a Boer general... Patrolling God and the Mauser. But uh, Magers Fontaine is brought to us by a guy called Cecil Rhodes, who was besieged in, a, in Kimberley, which was the home of the De Beers mining company, the largest diamond mine in the world. May still be to this day, I'm not sure. They are they, still they, a very big name still, in jewelry. Yeah. He owned the company. And so he's sitting there in Kimberley, and the, the Boers lay siege. And everything was going swimmingly until the Boers brought out a massive gun, a, a Crusoe gun that they took from the fort in Pretoria. And they start shelling the besieged defenders, including Cecil Rhodes and his poor benighted uh, British military commander, a guy named Keckwich, who just could not deal with <laughs> Cecil Rhodes. He and Cecil Rhodes starts squealing saying, you must relieve me, the situation is dire, and you must come relieve, lift the siege, send a relief column immediately, or I, as though he's the commander, or <laughs> I will surrender I the will city. I will surrender the city. So a British force 
And you know, we probably should have looked up the numbers before this video. Um, I, I can't remember how many British troops were with. Uh, we will include it because in the this is this is all off the cuff. I mean, there's. <laughs> we're we're um, probably should do uh, check our facts a little more, but uh, but Lord Methuen was the British commander, and so his orders were to relieve Kimberley, and again, British army, m late nineteenth century, logistically heavy. Um, he needs a railroad to take all the supplies for his army, and there is a railroad that goes from the Cape Colony conveniently right up to Kimberley. And the Boers knew this. They knew the British are going to have to follow it's, the it, course of well, the yeah, it's, it's not as though you can lay a track overnight. No. Um, the, the Boers were completely mobile. They could uh, jump on the horses that they brought themselves and, and move quickly. Uh, the British could not. They had a, a far more ponderous logistical train that relied on the railroads. So Methuen advances, fights a series of battles. The most significant prior to Marcus Fontaine was a battle on the, the Modder River, where he, f he crossed the Modder River. That was on November 28th, and he was bloodied significantly there um, by uh, the Boer defenders. This was the first time at Modder River, the first time that the Boers change their own tactics because they're learning as they go what works. They're learning better. on the fly and unlike a lot of professional militaries, they're able, because they're a small, loose organization, they can apply these changes immediately. Mm -hmm. You come out of an engagement and go, okay, this didn't work, now we're gonna do this. And it doesn't take, you know, 10 years of, of retraining Regiment after regiment yeah, they're, of soldiers. They're doing what work because if if they come up with something that fails, your your Boer commandos are simply going to go home. They're going to leave. They're, they're democratically elected. In previous battles, the Boers had begun to suffer. Again, this is still modern war, 1899. The British had excellent artillery, long-range artillery. And the Boers had fought in the 1880s against the British, the first Anglo-Boer War. A black powder war and so their their memories of fighting this battle is under the old black powder yes the american civil war take the high ground high ground high ground high ground because of black powder weapons it is to your advantage to be up high so you can have the bring the enemy under fire as long as possible because the trajectory of your bullets describe a parabolic curve so the higher you are, that means you can shoot at the enemy longer and keep him under your fire all the way up. When the Boers took this approach, this is what they had done before at Majuba Hill. You get at the top of the hill, black powder, standard doctrine. British artillery can engage them from long range. Yes. Modern artillery, high explosive lidite shells. This is modern, what we would definitely recognize as modern artillery from four, five, six thousand yards high explosive shells and artillery was the big killer of the first and second world wars that high explosive shrapnel from uh from shells and the boers realized if the british artillery can see us they can put a hurt on us we cannot respond yeah yet. you have no response to it so at mudder river um a a boer general who had recently arrived a guy named Cous de la Rey, had been watching how the previous battles had gone and he proposed we have flat trajectory rifles we do not need to be at the top of the hill we need to dig our trenches at the base of the hill and the trajectory of these rifles will still give us five or six hundred yards on this open belt to be able to engage the and the enemy. added the added tactical bonus of a surprise in doctrine changing, where um, and of course they they worked it into their their battle plans at Magus Fontaine, where they mm -hmm. made it appear as though they had positions atop the hill. Right, and they left <laughs> people visibly moving around up there. So when the British forces arrived in in the mm -hmm. AO. They're, you know, they looked at it as any yep, other set piece. There they, are. Yeah, there they are on top of the hill. Bring up the guns, and 
you have the Boers who have adjusted essentially overnight the way that they're going to fight this engagement, entrenched at the bottom of the hill in very well concealed positions. And there are accounts of, of Boer commandos laying on their backs, looking up the hill and watching the useless British artillery bombardment as a fireworks show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was the, the bombardment at Marcus Fontaine. When Lord Methuen decided, I'm going to attack here, um, he gave them 10 days to prepare. And the Boers knew exactly where he was coming because, again, he's tied to the railroad. So there's no, there's, there's no tactical or operational subtlety about this. He is coming on this exact route. Yep. So the Boers fell back after Modder River. To the next geographic. The next, this is the next best place. Um, and prepared their trenches and it took uh, it took Lord Matthew in 10 days to finally get moving in again and the whole time Cecil Rhodes in Kimberley is just screaming his head off saying I you got to relieve me at once so there's a political uh, his influence back in England is going all the way around a hemisphere and then you know <laughs> it's uh, winter in England they're snowed in at the <laughs> um in uh, in England, and in South Africa, it's the summer, so a continent and a, and a season away. Cecil Rhodes is complaining to England. His his political allies in England are sending back down, telling uh, Matthew and you have to move, you have to move. Uh, and he's still taking his sweet time. I suppose when you own the world's largest diamond mine, you. you probably have some friends in high places. Yeah, it was, it, there was, uh, well again, war is politics by other means. <laughs> so on the 10th, when uh, Methuen finally reaches what would be the battlefield of Marcus Fontaine, he sees the Boer artillery and uh, the, the Boer commandos at the top of Marcus Fontaine, the copy, the, the large copy there, which is just the of the word for a, a hill, a small hill. And on the 10th, opens fire, which is the largest bombardment since uh, the bombardment of Sevastopol in 1855 in the Crimean War. So there, there is some weight of shell being thrown, and it causes virtually no casualties whatsoever to the Boers because, again, on, on General Delaray's recommendation, they are now dug in in positions at the base of the hill and all the shells are going over their heads and bursting at the at the top. Where credit where credit's due, Coos de la Rye had every right to not be in the best frame of mind uh, going into the fight at Megger's Fontaine. Mm -hmm. um, he had had a son killed at Mata River, you know, we're talking less a than week, two weeks week earlier, right. prior um, and was that dedicated to the fight to still show up and go, okay, we need to tactically he went home, adjust. buried his son, and then took the railroad back down uh, to um, prepare. And he did not like the... And again, he's not the commander. He's just the good idea fairy. <laughs> you know, nine times out of ten, the good idea fairy, the ideas aren't very good, but his idea was good, and it was good enough. That, well, there's um, a reason there's a song about yeah, it. Well, the president of the Orange Free State agreed with him, and they fired the old commander, a guy named Prince Lou, and they put uh, General uh, Piet Cronje in command, and Delaray's influence, because it had worked so well at the Mata River, um, they decided to go along with this idea. And it wasn't like the obvious answer. The Boers did not like to fight this way with the hill behind them. Because the Boer... Well, it does. It goes war, against all of your previous you're, experience. You're up on top of the hill. You shoot at the enemy. And then the you enemy can gets leave. Close, then you run down the hill to where your horses are, and then you gallop away. So putting yourself in front of the hill meant you don't have... You do not it, have the option of If the of enemy reaches reach you and you need to run, you don't have to clamber up this hill, and the enemy's going to be shooting you in the back. So it was not like the... Oh, yeah. Duh. Why didn't we think yeah, of this before? It was, it it, was it took, a gamble. Right. Um, it, it wasn't like the obvious. It, it didn't fit in their way of fighting, but it goes to show 
how quickly they adapted to tactical realities and tactical capabilities that new weapon systems gave them. That's why, again, this is a paradigm shift. As you see the British doing, and it sort of mirrors it mirrors World War One tactics to a certain degree. This is the enemy's known position. We dump yeah, a mountain of shells on ever. top of it, <laughs> and then we we rush it with the bayonet. Um, and at Maker's Fontaine, that simply did not work. They fired a boatload of artillery shells into unoccupied positions on top of a hill and boldly formed into their columns and marched into a wall of Mauser and it, bullets. And it made, if you look at the British doctrine of the day, it made perfect there was sense. a reason for it. It made they, perfect sense until the Boers started shooting. Yes. Uh, but again, their, their concern is on command and control. Yes. And, you know, by 1899, the British doctrine was not... We fight in column, so they're not doing column attacks like the no, Austrians it's, it's were in, not in 1866. Kind of the the plan, because again, they know modern weapons, long danger space, flat trajectory. So if we're going to attack a position, we're going to attack a hill. Doctrine says you you take your men forward at night, but at night you can't see anything. That's the point. That's the darkness is shielding you from enemy bullets from their new powerful long range weapons. You move under cover of night, the enemy can't see you, but it also means the only way to keep your forces together is to pack them in in columns. So the doctrine says you will advance under cover of darkness at night. At dawn, you deploy into your open formation, so you go into what we would now consider more of a modern extended skirmish order. So you're not standing there shoulder to shoulder in ranks like Civil War or mid-19th century, you are an open order because, again, these are modern weapons and you know we all know what happens if you get caught in a column up against uh, modern rapid-fire, small-bore, high-velocity rifles. You basically die in place. They know this, but you still have to get your soldiers up close enough so that an assault can be successful. That's done at night and that's done generally in column so that the commander still has his troops in a relatively small space, and he has Especially the ability at night, because it's not command. as though you know if you're if you're if you're if you're staging an attack under the cover of darkness, you have to have your men local. And it's, it's, it's not as though it's brilliant to you know get on a loudspeaker. Okay, yeah. hey, you take that column over yeah. there. Everybody has to be sort of well, condensed. frequently they would have an advance party go forward with ropes, and they would lay ropes yes. out, and the columns would follow these ropes so that in theory, when the sun comes up, you know, first light of dawn, as long as they follow the everyone line, is in, the, right in the positions they need to be in order to launch the attack. Then your artillery opens up and you move forward and you're close enough that the enemy doesn't have you in their sights as long as Very they would long. otherwise. So you that's close the, theory, the distance. And it makes sense mm -hmm. for, for an army that's concerned with command and control. Uh, the, the Prussians would have done it differently. But Very again, so. no one knew that at the time. That's why this is a, a change. This is you know, that, that paradigm shift. I, I probably use that phrase too much, but I don't know what else to call it. It's a change from the old norms and staying in the old way of doing things is now... A, a non-starter. You, you you go on the battlefield using these old tactics and you die in place. You, you, it is a decisive break from the way things were before. And uh, on the night of the 10th, the British artillery fires. They do their preliminary bombardment and the British advance. Um, Lord Methuen had an observation balloon. Didn't use it. Uh, there had been torrential rains. The night, even though this is summer in South Africa, the night was still bitterly cold. So it's cold, muddy, and as often happens, even when you have your guide ropes placed... Uh, People are still going to get lost. There was lots of confusion. There was a fence. Again, you talk about um, <laughs> things to come later. There was a barbed wire fence 
that was just a property marker um, that the Boers put their trenches behind knowing that the British will have to cross this barbed wire fence. That was an obstacle. The British did not know the fence was there just because of the, the way the, the fence round was. was. There. And it's not as though... You know, it's not as though on the tool belt in, in a squad someone's got a pair of wire cutters. No, not in 1899. No, no 1916, <laughs> for sure. Um, and the British also had no idea that the Boer trenches were at the base nope. of the hill. They did not know that they were there. N completely clueless that there are thousands of Boer soldiers with modern rifles level with the ground and, and the the ground leading up to the copy is a slight rise but it's it's not a, uh, a, a rapid topographical increase so the British are coming up to them and so the Boers in these trenches at ground level can look out down and see the British coming up to them it's a slight incline but the, the British had no idea they were there. Um, some of the very, Boer... very, very well concealed, pre-constructed positions. And then, of course, imagine uh, for the average rifleman in the British regiments laying there waiting for the assault. In your mind, the top of that hill has just been shellacked with more artillery rounds than you've seen expended in your entire career. So there's a certain level of, of confidence going, we're, we're just going to walk up and, and essentially occupy the ground. Yeah, they, they might not have been that, like, uh, uh, naive after the, the treatment they had just gotten at Mata River, but they, they expected the Boers to be a lot farther Somewhere away else. than they were. So these, these British were advancing, and the, the, most of the casualties were suffered by the Highland Brigade under the command of a, an interesting guy called uh, Wachope. And he had no idea at one point that the Boers were only 400 meters away. He thinks they're at the top of the hill, which is another at least a thousand meters beyond. And even for a Boer soldier, thousand meters is a very is, long that is a way. long way for someone with open sights, iron sight, um, rifle to hit. Especially shooting with all that adrenaline. So he, and, they and... were not like thinking we are imminently in the dangerous space of riflemen 400 yards away with modern weapons. He, you know, Wako believed the enemy is still far away and he wanted to keep his soldiers in their columns as long as possible because once you break out of those columns into extended order and the order to attack and charge up the hill is given, you're essentially you, you lost. Right, you're just... You know, you're, you're just in it for the glory at that point. Of course, this so, is a man who brought a claymore, a basket-hilted claymore sword <laughs> on his belt into a fight with smokeless rifles. And, uh, and should have known better because British officers had been getting picked off uh, because of their, their insignia and distinctive uniforms and swords by Boer riflemen up until this point. So probably should have known better. And one of his subordinates asked him when they were, you know, give or take about 400 yards from the, the Boer lines, should we deploy? So in other words, should we get out of these columns where you've got all your soldiers packed in a column, shoulder to shoulder, um, fo in a, a 40 meter wide column? Should we break out of here and deploy into our open order and start moving forward? And Wachope said, no. no, let's keep them in the columns a little longer to get a little closer. And that is when uh, someone tripped an alarm that the Boers had, had rigged. thousand riflemen with bolt action magazine fed seven millimeter rifles and piles of clips and all the ammunition they could shoot open fire 
at the first light of dawn on a column sized target so 40 meter front essentially impossible you to cannot miss. miss and in five minutes Wakop is killed his second in command who said should be deployed is killed 60% of their officers are killed and 700 British soldiers from the proudest regiments of the British Army. So we're talking about the Black Watch, the Seaforth Highlanders, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. Um, storied, legendary histories in these regiments. And the men died in droves in front of a point-blank range in front of a trench that they did not even know was there. They had no clue. Um, the accounts were censored after the, the you know none of this got back out to the newspapers at home no. but these regiments and, and honestly th there is no other answer there's nothing else to do if you were exposed on an open belt under that kind of withering fire the only th you die or you run and, and they ran um, so Wakop was killed along with uh, most of the officers. And in this battle, the British suffered a, you know, somewhere under a thousand casualties, but almost the overwhelming majority of casualties were, were the first five open minutes. In a few minutes and they were disproportionately suffered by the, the Highland Brigade um, because they were still in column, standing on their feet in column and uh, in, in front of, of modern <laughs> seven millimeter Mauser rifles. And it, it was a, it, no other word for it, a, a complete, just total slaughter. Essentially no a one, shooting gallery. No one knew the Boers were there. So the British were completely taken, totally by surprise. And they had a barbed wire fence. So you can't go forward um, due to the fence. You're, you're taking this withering fire. All they could do was go to ground. And uh, in this part of the battle, they waited until dark until they could finally fall back. Laying under accurate and sustained rifle fire from sunup to dark. And they had done the same thing at Motor River. But at Motor River, the Boers fell back, jumped on their horses, and retreated. Disappeared. Um, so the other, the <laughs> other thing that, that it comes up, and I, I can't remember the specific engagement, but you see it repeatedly in, in after-action accounts of British casualties, where those who are wounded after the initial shock engagement, they're all being shot in the buttocks, in the back of their ankles, mm -hmm. in their feet. You know, that's Motor River um, and uh, Makos Fontaine. It's because they are face down in the dirt praying to God to remove the buttons from their blouse so they can get closer. It goes to tell you um, cover. Cover versus you, concealment. You don't need a whole lot of cover to cover yourself. I, I took my company out uh, to Camp Pendleton a few months ago. And we had a class on cover versus concealment. Mm -hmm. And you take a soldier, you know, one of my, someone a little... <laughs> I need quite a bit of cover now. <laughs> but you take one of my 19-year-old soldiers, you put him down, and you, like, you, nine inches of cover. If, if you put yourself behind nine inches of earth, that is cover. That's all you need. So you can imagine this belt. There could not have been very much cover. So if you're so pressed down to earth that you're getting shot in the buttocks and your ankles, that is five or six inches at, at most in some of these places. And these are flat trajectory rifles that command that space. You don't have that, that well, the, parabolic the, the black site power graduation, The site graduation on your 7 mm Well, you can't Mauser, go lower than... It doesn't even, you don't even start touching the sights for what is it? Is it 400 on this one? Four, 400 meters. 400 meters, you don't even bother with the rear sight. It's okay, you know, and, and bear in mind, the modern United States Army rifle qual goes <laughs> out to 300 meters and we, stops. We don't shoot beyond 300. Uh, like, that's call for fire. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that's mortar's problem. Yep. Um, and so you have these boers who are in a concealed, prepared position, yeah. 
all the ammunition they could possibly shoot. And, and you, from you don't have to be an expert marksman to hit a column at a, at a no. target that size, with all the ammunition you can shoot from a a, a uh, concealed and sh protected position. Which uh, which engagement was it with the um, when they went to the boar position that had been vacated and surveyed the brass that was left behind? Well, that that particular account that was a journalist at at Mata Rivers so that was only ten days earlier. Mm. And uh, they they go to the British trenches at the end of the battle after Boer the Boers trenches. after the Boers had left, and they are ankle deep in brass seven millimeter Mauser cases. And so they could sleep on it. They could bury their could, dead in uh, it. Just because uh, all day long, just blazing um, away. Yeah, the 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 journalist um, he he called it. Hell's vomit. He said the fire started at first dawn and it did not stop. It kept that same intensive pitch. The other, the other, the, the other um, memorable aspect of that account that has stuck with me is. No one had yet. No one had yet encountered sustained supersonic right. rifle yeah. fire at the time, and so he's struggling to describe the sound you, of. You can't if you're used to hearing. <laughs> even if you've been in battle, you know, you've seen the elephant a few times, and you've you've heard rounds coming over. They're all subsonic because a black powder rifle bullet is going subsonic. so slow. Well, so you and I, you and I have both been out to either our secret super desert testing facility. Or, um, or Camp Beer, or, uh, or uh, Fort Benning. <laughs> or, yeah, or other places. Uh, for those of you who've been in the military where they fire overhead, they do nick at night, yep. and you can hear the snap of s supersonic ammunition. We've been out where we've had muskets fired overhead just to actually hear what it sounds like. And you it can almost not even really hear it. It's, and it, it's... it does genuinely sound like a bumblebee. It's, it's a whizzing... You can hear the distance of travel on it yeah. with with supersonic ammo. You can ammo, tell it's, it's moving slow. Crack. So, yeah, it's, no, you don't hear the bullet. All you hear is the sonic boom. Yes. Behind it. Um, um, and and so this reporter is struggling to put to that into words it. because he had been at Omdurman, and he still had no. It, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. So this I'll isn't find this isn't someone who is you know virginal to combat, but still had no idea how to describe, you know, incoming, rapid and sustained mm -hmm. supersonic fire, um, which is, you know, for those of us who have crawled under the tracers in one basic training or another, um, it's, uh, it's certainly stronger than a cup of coffee. Yeah, no, and you don't forget it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> crack, crack, crack. Yeah, it, it, uh... And it wouldn't be the last time either. No. Um, because the, the doctrine doesn't change overnight. No, not at all. And, and of course, we're still, seeing, we're still seeing the British military as the easy example, evolving with tactical changes up through the, you know, the First World War. Yeah, and they had adopted all of their tactics also for colonial enemies because that's who you're fighting. You can't blame them to say, well, why weren't you planning to fight like a European enemy? Well, it's, it's, it's well, the same question. We don't need to fight a European enemy because they'll never get to us. We have twice as many battleships as they do. Yeah, we yeah. cannot be invaded. All we need to do is police our empire. So the British Army had been crafted around tactics for policing the empire, the Zulu War, Abyssinia, the India Frontier Wars. Um, Don't get me wrong; it's not to devalue. Sudan. It's not to devalue the experiences of of, of the Zulu War and Abyssinia, because I certainly wouldn't trade places with anybody at Warks Drift. But it does, like hindsight being twenty twenty, mm -hmm. it's it's almost like if you're a heavyweight boxer and all you do professionally is beat the hell out of featherweights. You're going to get comfortable doing it, and you're not going to be training to fight another heavyweight. There's no reason for you to do it. 
You don't have to, especially if you're the biggest one on the block. You're not worried about it anymore. Um, and then, of course, you roll into 15 years later, you know, we're rolling into the Somme, and you still have British soldiers getting up and walking casually towards the enemy. Yeah, they had also been told the artillery would have yes. taken them out. The artillery has done its job. Um, but the, the Boer War, at least, though, uh, it, it was the the zenith or the the high water point of the individual soldier yes and as the far rifle. as the actual individual rifleman being the tactical uh lynch the, the casual the chief casualty producing yes. because after ranch, that it's it becomes artillery, artillery. and it, it's still um, to this day it is it is our indirect fire is still that is what you know they don't they call themselves the king of battle for a reason <laughs> Better an in, artilleryman than an NP. In, in der, well, yeah, that goes without saying. <laughs> but our, our, the indirect fire is what, that is your, uh, it is what the rifle was in the, the Boer War because. So you the, look at it, and, and, and as you brought up in your book, yes, the proper rifle it still has an influence on, on modern day military training. But the actual window where it was the true star in the spotlight is really from 1851 to 1900. And everything after that, it, it yeah. slowly, it slowly fades. I, I, would, I would even go as far as to say 1897, because 1897 is when the French, um, Adopted what you know the French seventy five yes seventy five millimeter field gun that had a recoil mechanism on it so that you could fire this modern artillery piece without having to stop roll it roll back into position back and in re aim it because artillery before that time you fire it and then you've lost your point of aim you have to now Aiming start all rounds. over and aim with the French seventy five because of that recoil absorbing mechanism on it you you aimed it. And then you would just fire it as fast as you yes, could load it. The, so the six, recoil, seven, eight rounds a The minute. recoil device allows you to essentially create a beaten zone rather than just... Yeah, you don't, you don't have to aim each shot. So suddenly, 1897, the potential, the firepower of artillery goes from being almost like a three-round-a-minute maximum. Like well, so you and, I, you and I have both been around Civil War era cannons being live fired and if they're cooking with gas it's two maybe three maybe rounds three. a minute with a french 75 and even today mm -hmm. if you look at the 105 millimeter howitzer that the u.s army is still using it's not all that different it you can if you have a good gun crew it is as fast as you can close the breech block no yeah. you're firing that gun and that, that enables artillery to, you know, it, rapidly it, it owned the battlefield of, of the First World War. Two thirds of all casualties from the First World War were from artillery, and similar numbers from uh, from the Second World War. Because of that, if you didn't have that recoiling, uh, the recoil absorbing mechanism on it, uh, artillery would not have been as decisive as it, as it turned into. But so. For us, the... But that wasn't around 1897. That was a French state secret. In fact, there's a major controversy in French military history over the Dreyfus affair because uh, he was supposedly selling secrets and, and a French officer was scapegoated for selling the secrets of the French 75. They kept it a very close hold. No one else can learn this, but other countries figured it out yes. soon enough. But the Boers had none of those guns. All of the guns in the Boer War had to be re-aimed. Guns, artillery pieces, had to be re-aimed after each shot. So for, for us, focusing primarily on, obviously, rifles, uh, of which we have a few, the, the sort of epoch of the rifle ended... Yeah, this was its zenith. Yeah, know, they, ended they, at, at very nearly Major's Fontaine. New, New Year's 1900 was three weeks later. And you see a rapid evolution after that. And it was... 
Well, something else arrives, too, around the same time. Yes, something which, unfortunately, we don't have to put on the rack. Not or a tripod. Yet. Or... Um, <laughs> if we were to establish a Patreon and beg for a decade, maybe. Um, <laughs> we need a Maxim gun. Yes, just just one Maxim gun. We're only gun. asking for one. Uh, and then we need a we small greedy. a small army of people to run presses to to load uh, loan cartridges for it. Um, but so for us, that the focus, you know, this sort of ends our era of research. Um, at, at 1899, 1900. Because after that, yes, riflemen are still playing an integral role to infantry tactics, but, but they are the not the primary producers. role. They are not, no, the, not um, they are not the king of battle anymore. Well, don't, uh, don't say that to an 11 Bravo. <clears throat> I don't have to say that to anybody anymore. Uh, and if you are an 11 Bravo or an MP, and you are watching this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. But remember that uh, there are other MOSs in the Army who breathe through their nose. You should try it sometime. Logistics war. <laughs> so, um, on that note... Yeah, the, the Boers did something at Mockersfontein that they did not do at previous battles, and that is held the field. They didn't abandon the battlefield like they had done before. Which so sort of confused a lot the of the morning of the twelfth of British December officers. the British woke up and the Boers were still there in these positions. And you know again, long story short, eventually uh, Kimberly was relieved and uh, and these early war set piece battles, that's what they called the, the, the first four or five months of the Second Anglo Boer War was the what they called the set piece battles. So that's where the, the Boers have an army and the British have an army yes. and they would fight a battle. After after February of uh, nineteen hundred, the main Boer army is actually captured the whole thing surrenders at Paderborg and it turns into three more incredibly bloody and grueling years of guerrilla warfare and that's where we see for the first time the concentration camp comes out of it and a a complete physical occupation uh, the British taught us if you really want to be an insurgency and you yes. want to you want to snuff it out the British taught us entirely subjugate they the taught population. us how you do it. You well, can, if you look at the the blockhouse strategy, where they yeah, essentially they put the Transvaal on the map, occupy, occupy the entire chop country. it into grid squares, and if you build a fortification in every single one of these and occupy it, then so, you will control and, and the country. anyone that can provide any aid or benefit to the enemy. Lock them up or kill is, them. Is is uh, is and, driven uh, off. Um, yeah, they they taught us how to beat an insurgency. Um, so the, the set piece battle era, um, you know, still had these paradigm shifting moments, and, and Makar's Fontaine was the second of three battles that composed the Black Week of the the British war effort in South Africa. There was the Battle of Stromberg, which was on the tenth, and then and again we don't have notes off the top of my head. I think Colenso was the 14th or 15th of December. I, I can't it was remember. Within, it was in, it was within break, a week. I've just had half a day. bottle of scotch, so you're going to have to <laughs> cut me a break. Yeah, I was still in the black week in Colenso. I don't know. Can we do a video on Colenso? It's the same thing. It's Boers with Mausers just completely See, that, chopping down more British. Yeah, that's, who that's un it's an unfortunate recurring theme. The, the Boers were here, and they had Mausers, and the British walked into them in, in one iteration or another. Um, so ne not necessarily needing to do a video on Colenso, although if you're looking for an opportunity to go to the desert testing facility and expend uh, more money into noise, then by all means. I'm going to have to load more, load more 7 mil. Um, I, left so a, I left a trench full of brass cases. 
<laughs> that were about up to your toes. The last time, yeah. No, I, I wish. That would be nice. Um, so oh, brand new, too. Those cases, they dug up cases from the Blue Oh, yeah, War. well... Most of them are stamped 1899, so they must have received a large new. shipment of ammunition. Certainly not old surplus click bang. No, this is uh, this was brand new rifles, brand new. There's ammunition. nothing like the smell of 80 year old cordite in the morning. Um, so on that note, uh, cheers to the Boers and the Brits. Um, yeah, well, paradigm shifts. Again, they're they're ugly, and it it gives me. And again, you know, Army Reserve logistics captain. I'm not exactly Pentagon level strategist, but I appreciate learning from these moments so that we don't. We will make the same mistakes again. The question is, how do you mitigate them? How do you how do you mitigate the effects of a paradigm shift? Now, a whole bunch of armor soldiers are probably going to dislike <laughs> this video when I say the tank is as obsolete on the modern battlefield today. Yes. I would argue, again, logistics captain, you can paint me if you want to. It's just my theory. It's as obsolete as the column was for the British tactic to uh, attack a hill. Now, that said, if that. you're out there and you have a tank... We would love to test it for scientific, purely scientific purposes. So if you do own a tank... Let me piss off a whole bunch more people. Let us know. Aircraft carriers are as obsolete as the column was. You do realize that you just had half the Navy that are never going to follow us now. I'm sort of okay... Acceptable losses. I, I'm sort of okay with MPs falling into the, uh, the collateral damage category oh, I've Calvin's never met, woken up Calvin, Calvin has woken up I've never met anyone who likes MPs who is not an MP if you are someone who likes MPs that isn't an MP comment comment below we are curious why <laughs> anyway thank you for joining us um, there will be obviously a range video of some kind for the Boer War coming up uh, if you have ideas as to what we should do, please comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for joining Brett, Calvin, and I uh, at papercartridges.com. Cheers. Good night. How <laughs> Calvin woke up right at the end. Please put me in the credits. Please put me in the credits. I'm a war hero.